Good morning. Well, good morning for me. Good day, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. I'm going to say it is good to be back. <laughs> for those of you that have hung out on uh, Death by Design before, then you know that the purpose of this show is to take a little time to dive into design basics. We usually <laughs> come on every Monday at uh, 10 a.m. Eastern Time. The show has been on a bit of an extended hiatus. Um, for those of you that follow me on Twitter, you know that this is because I uh, ruptured my left eardrum a couple months ago. What a fun time. It was a great experience. Zero of 10. Cannot recommend. Um, but that made it very difficult to wear earbuds. Um, very difficult to hear that kind of feedback that's really necessary for streaming. So we took a little break, we did a little healing up, we did a little recharging, and now we're back. And I gotta say, I really, really missed hanging out with y'all. Good morning. Hello to folks that are hopping into the chat. Yeah, I miss this. I miss just like hanging out and like starting my week this way with y'all. So it feels really, really good to be back. Um, trying to think if there is a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so we've got webinars coming up for those of you that, again, may not know. Um, Code It Live is our progress teller channel. So we have got a whole bunch of releases. Our three release just happened. So if you use any of the Kendo UI component libraries, any of the Telerik libraries, we've got stuff dropping and coming out. Uh, there will be a webinar that's starting actually, I believe right after this, not on this channel, because um, our webinars are in a, in a separate channel. But if you are interested at all in our test studio, R3 release that is happening at 11 a.m. So this is actually going to be, I'm going to cut this just a smidgen short so that we don't overlap. And then you can log on tomorrow uh, to the webinars and I will be going through all of the Kendo UI release goodness with Alyssa and Carl, which is always a blast. Um, <laughs> let me see if I can find, there's a banner, like a little, there's something somewhere that will run the information on the webinars. I'm going to find them. Here we go. Yeah. So do, 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 do. release webinar. Boom. Free live Kendo UI R3 2022 release webinar tomorrow, 11 a.m. Eastern time or do today. It's not too late to hop over to the test studio R3 release webinar right after this. You do have to register for those. Um, but again, it is free. And it's a very cool little peek into everything that is coming out. I am going to, because of my high Kendo bias, I'm going to leave the Kendo UI one <laughs> and the Kendo UI banner running for a little bit um, as folks join. Um, but that'll definitely be a good time. So you will want to do that. But y'all are here for design. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I am doing much better now. I felt like... Uh, weirdly, like the ultimate test of seeing whether I was healed or not was going to be to get on an airplane, you know, with all the like pressure changes and stuff. Um, and I did. I we recently actually just came back from DevReach in Boston, which probably some of y'all were there as well. I got to meet, that was actually a lot of fun. I got to meet a bunch of our like Twitch folks, folks that show up. All of y'all that I normally just know as like an avatar and a username, I got to meet in person, which was fantastic so cool but anyway yes healing complete back full ready ready to start ready to dig into some design so i know again it has been a while since we were on the air but we've been kind of working our way slowly we talked all the way through color and then we talked a bunch about about like grid and balance and kind of putting your elements on the page and now I think we're ready to start digging into some typography, which is really cool. Typography is probably one of my like favorite parts of design because um, it's just so, it's so unique, I think. Like, and it's so powerful, right? Like all the other things, intrinsically very cool. Type, you can really create a design by itself, right? Because the letters themselves are actually 
design elements like the characters there's so much design that goes into a single typeface and then we put that typeface into a bigger design and just you can really get really really granular and the amount of attention like typeface designers blow my mind the people that spend all of their time kind of really artistically crafting these letter forms and thinking very carefully about how they will flow together and how you can adjust a typeface and like <laughs> spinning myself up but in order to i believe fully appreciate the depth of all of that we really have to start by talking about just characters just what makes a character and how we can break down again these individual characters into their base parts i really learned to kind of appreciate them and assess them because i think once you have a feeling for what sets you know what defines a character that helps you tell the different typefaces apart and that helps you choose the one that's best suited for your project so rewinding all of that we're gonna look at all the parts of a single character today we're gonna down all the like anatomy basically of individual letter forms so i'm gonna share my screen real quick so yeah here's a quick example great so obviously when we're looking at things that feel very noticeably different it's easy for us to start to call out differences right we can say like oh yeah like bodoni is so much thicker each of the individual kind of lines here are way 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 thicker than helvetica right and they've got these like little these little serifs on them we look at bodoni and it feels noticeably different to helvetica but then when we look at something like ariel and helvetica Hmm, it doesn't seem as immediately obvious. So we need to start really digging into the bits and pieces, the really granular parts of, of characters in order to start telling them apart, right? And there are differences. When you learn to kind of look at them, right? I think one of the big ones, the tail on this A, right? The curve here, there's a little bit more, uh, Helvetica is incredibly like even and geometric and aerial, not quite so much, but it's subtle. It's so, so, so subtle. First though, right? Let's take a look at some of these terms that we use to talk about just the measurements and the placement and how much space an individual character takes up, right? So kind of starting from the top, working our way down, ascenders. Ascenders are all the way kind of above usually like the tallest of your capital letters right and we see those with our really like long sometimes an l will reach up there an h a k things that really stretch above and beyond your cap height is the average capital height of the character when it is in all caps um sometimes you will see parts of a character that will reach above or below some of these lines. Like, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit here. Like this G is a good example. You can kind of see that it technically arcs above this line here, right? So everything is aligned, but this curve here reaches above. And that would be the same if we had like a C or an O or something here it might technically ascend slightly past the cap height of the typeface but that's done intentionally it's not a mistake um, that is done so that it feels balanced with the rest of the letters because if you were to shrink the rounded letters so that the very top of them aligned here they would actually feel smaller um, when we looked at them they would feel proportionally smaller so this kind of uh, wiggle room, I guess this may be the right word, in defining the heights and choosing the heights of your letters is done intentionally. It's kind of a visual balance thing. You remember when we talked about visual weight um, and kind of equalizing that weight across the whole of your page? The same thing happens on a much smaller scale when we're talking about typefaces and typeface design. It's important for all of these letters to feel visually balanced because you don't want a situation where like one half of a word feels heavier, like it feels 
awkward when that happens. So when we zoom in really, really, really close on some of these, you'll see places where designers have like bent the rules a little bit to make everything feel right. <laughs> moving along the midline oh yeah here's another example with that h doing that like arc slightly up over the midline because that is what makes the most sense that's how it feels right if this top of the midline thing here hit down here the h would not feel it wouldn't actually feel like it was in the middle anyway rant enough on that <laughs> the midline is sometimes also called the x height uh and i actually like x height better as a term right because it creates the flat line here. When we're talking about an X or, you know, there's a couple other letters that do this that don't have that arc or that don't reach above or below. An X is like a perfect square most of the time, at the very least a rectangle. So you end up cutting a very like solid line across the top. W's do the same, V's do the same. Um, can you think of what else? A lowercase Z usually, sometimes if it has a serif, no. But um, the X will always be straight across the top. That helps you really measure, right? And the other thing about the midline is that, as you might notice from this diagram, it's not actually in the exact middle, right? If, if we were gonna draw a midline, we'd probably put it down here. But again, that wouldn't work proportionally. So, Midline, a little bit of a deceptive term, it does refer to kind of the height of your lowercase letters, right? The height of the, the middle of your lowercase letters, because in situations like the H, you'll have an A sender that reaches above, but it's not exactly in the middle and it should not be. So the X height might be a slightly more accurate term, but you will hear both. Finally, we have our baseline here. This is where all of your letters will align across the bottom. The baseline is really, really important because that's how we are going to lay things out as a designer. Right? Most of the time when we are setting type, we're looking at the baseline and how the baseline aligns with the other elements that are on the page. We need to be able to kind of center things or you know vertically make them whoop, make sense. Sorry about that. And the midline, the baseline really helps us do that. The midline helps a little bit too. Um, that's how we handle our letting, our underlines, our superscripts, our subscripts. All of that stuff is keyed off of that baseline value. So it's really important to kind of be aware of where your type is, is settled, where it aligns. You'll even uh, see that sometimes in things like CSS properties, right? So when you set your vertical align, you can set that to the baseline. And that is what is this is the baseline. <laughs> uh, along the bottom here, we have our descender. So anything that kind of stretches down, right? Your Y's, your G's, um, your J's, things that kind of dip below will come along the descender line. This happens most often with lowercase letters, but you will occasionally see descenders on uppercase letters. Um, I think the Q is probably the most common example of an uppercase letter that dips beneath the uh, baseline. So, <laughs> zoom back out on this guy, see the whole thing. <laughs> Next, right? Uh, we want to kind of take a look at the literal individual parts of the character. You're seeing like my whole draft here, right? Ah, so a little sneak peek. Here's a little bit of secret information for you. I'm writing an ebook. It's in fact mostly done. The entirety of the first draft is done, but all of the stuff that we're talking about here on Dev by Design, and then also I've been doing a conference talk called Learn Enough Design to Be Dangerous. All of that stuff is getting compiled together into a book, which is so cool to me. I'm very excited <laughs> to be getting all of this written and into a book and shared with all of y'all in a way that is less like stream of consciousness than I do when I'm here uh, just on the stream hanging out with y'all live. But the draft is done. It is uh, currently being 
edited. I don't have like a date or anything when I can tell y'all it will be out or like look for it, but trust me, I will be talking it up as soon as I do. <laughs> so just, you know, keep your eyes open. But anyway, when you see me scrolling through stuff and there's just like a bunch of text, uh, that's the draft for <laughs> the chapter of the ebook that talks about this stuff, which is so cool. <laughs> anyway, back to typography. As you can see from this like example here, literally every single piece of a character has a specific name. In general, this is not necessarily something that you really need to know in order to design effectively, not like every single one of these. Uh, this is mostly if you're looking to like design a typeface yourself, which is really fun. Like I think it's a cool exercise and everyone should do it. It gives you a much deeper appreciation for fonts and for typography and for like thought and care that goes into all of that. But that's not to say you need to memorize all of this, right? This is really just informational to kind of help you orient. Uh, and there are a few that I think are especially worth talking about. So I'm going to call them out. But yeah, don't feel the need to like, you know, you don't need to know all of this in order to be a good designer. <laughs> uh, so here are some of the ones that I think are especially worth knowing about. Ascenders and descenders. You probably like we just talked about that uh, in terms of the last section, but they're important here again when we're looking at this like broader picture. Our ascenders here that rise up above the uh, ascender line, and our descenders that drop down here. And you can see those kinds of things remain the same across all types of ha, all types all types of typefaces. So this typeface, the serif looks deeply different, right, than this one, the sans serif, all these terms are going to be the same across the board. Next, bowls and counters. So when you're talking about a letter that has an enclosed space, uh, and those are like O's, P's, Q's, G's, then you're talking about bowls, right? So this is a bowl, this is a bowl, this is a bowl, all of these right that kind of enclose a specific space that is a bowl now the empty space that is inside of that bowl is known as the counter right and the counter of the counter space of any given typeface has a lot to do with how readable it is that can help you make a choice about whether it's the right typeface for you to use or not so Typefaces that have larger bowls and therefore larger counters often are easier to read because the letters look more distinct, they're more quickly identifiable, um, they, we just recognize them easier because they're more in line with what we expect the letters to look like. Whereas typefaces that are in a heavier weight, uh, that have kind of naturally smaller bowls or possibly no counters at all if they're like completely blacked out, like very, very small bowls, those are a little bit more difficult right? Uh, they feel a little bit tighter, they feel a little bit heavier and closer, and it can be a little bit harder to read. So let's actually take a look. Let's go to Google Fonts and see if we can find some like really heavy looking typefaces and see how that changes the bulls encounters, right? Not sure why I'm getting that in another language. It's kind of cool. Neat. So right, so here Pretty easy. As we get here, they get a little bit chunkier, right? And all of the letters start to look more similar because they're all super heavy. They have the same weight and the differentiators, those balls and counters, along with some of the other stuff are obscured because the typeface is so much heavier. It all starts to feel very blocky. Our eyes kind of gloss over it a little bit. Whereas these are more distinguishable. We see them more as individual letters and we don't start to like see that line. We don't see the shape of it as much as we do here. We start to see these as, as shapes and not necessarily letters. It's interesting. And that has a lot to do with um, when we are talking about, um, sorry, Ooh, words left me. Gestalt theory. There we go. I got it. I had to really go through the Rolodex for that one. <laughs> we're talking about Gestalt theory, right? Um, we're talking about similarity. I don't know. For those of you that weren't there, 
do a quick little googly google on that, right? So Gestalt theory and similarity says that items that are similar, we are going to perceive to kind of be related as opposed to things that are dissimilar, right? So here's this example where um, they've got these ones that are all the same color, so we assume those must be the same. And then there's, there's one. There's one that I really like that has them like grouped into um, like lines. Yeah, right. So here we see these as rows because of the color grouping. So even though they're technically all different, right? There's nothing that says these should be seen as the same. We start to group them. The same thing happens with type, right? So we're doing the same kind of thing here where we're saying like, oh, these all look really similar. We're starting to chunk them together into a big line. But <laughs> back again to our anatomy. But that's just why, why this kind of stuff is important, why this matters, right? So when you're choosing a typeface, you can go with something that's a heavier weight. It's just going to be a little bit harder to read. Those bowls and those counters are going to close up. They're going to make it more difficult to tell the letter forms apart. And that'll be a little bit trickier in terms of making sure that things are highly readable. That's why when you're reading a book, right, you know, or when you're reading a magazine article or a blog, you're never going to see it set in that like super, super heavy kind of typeface. You're going to see them set generally in lighter typefaces, often in serif typefaces. And that's done specifically because it's easier to tell letters apart uh, when we use those kinds of fonts, right? Those help us distinguish, those help us read faster. So, thank you, Boss Fighter. <laughs> I'm glad. I always jump on here and I'm like, I love this stuff. I love design, I love typography. I never know if anyone else is gonna care. So it's cool to always hear other people uh, also interested in it. And of course, um, questions welcomed always. If you have a just a, a thought, a reaction, a question, anything, pop it in the chat. <laughs> I love to hear from y'all. It's much more fun, especially for me who hops on these streams first thing in the morning, a little bit of interaction. God bless. <laughs> so next, stems, bars, crossbars. These refer to the various parts of the characters that are straight lines effectively, right? So your stems are going to be your kind of up and down parts here, right? A T, an R, a K all have uh, a stem. Bars are your horizontal lines that extend out, you know, kind of sideways, right? Your E's, your F's. There's actually not like a great, I guess the T has a bar. <laughs> so uh, I'm trying to see if there were any others that had bars. I think just the T. Uh, in this example. But yeah, E's and F's are the other big ones um, that will have them that kind of like stretch across. However, if you have a horizontal bar like that that connects two lines, then it's called a crossbar. That's slightly different. So that's your A's, your H's. Um, that's kind of the big ones. Yeah, your uppercase A's and H's where you're connecting straight across. So these are really handy terms for you to know, especially if you happen to be a developer, which I know a lot of our audience is. They're really handy because these will align with those heights and measurements that we discussed in the last kind of section, right? So when we're talking about figuring out your X height, your midline, your cap height, a lot of those are kind of determined by where these stems and bars fall. So jumping back up, right? Na, 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 to hear to what we were looking at before you can see like if you were going to have a crossbar straight across the middle that's going to that's going to align here on this midline or on the x height right when you have your bars on an e or an f those are going to align on your cap height on your baseline like those are going to kind of set they're, they're going to match these proportions and so when you are setting your type when you're keeping an eye on Kind of aligning keying off the baseline or keying off the cap height you know if you, sorry i don't know how that's i just slammed my hand into the microphone which i'm sure did not sound great to y'all i just i gesture when i talk i can't help it um sorry 
when you are setting things, you're keying off of these <laughs> like different heights. Uh, and you'll do that, especially when you're doing things like setting uh, superscripts or subscripts when you're putting asterisks in, when you are aligning images around your text, like knowing where all of this kind of lines up visually will help you place other elements on the page around them in a way that makes a lot of sense. That is keyed off this kind of design. So really good question in the comment. What is the goal of serifs? So a couple kind of answers to this, right? Um, first is they're decorative. They, they look nice. They look fancy, right? They add a little bit of flourish and that can really help differentiate a typeface. A lot of people kind of feel like sans serif typefaces look very similar. So like, we're gonna jump back real quick. Google fonts, we're gonna swap these down so that we only see sans serifs, right? And on like, certainly these are quite different. <laughs> we can we can tell them apart. There's difference especially in uh, width. There's differences in how exactly geometric, how round they are, right? So some will be very, like the O's will be perfectly circular. Some of them not so much. But overall, when we look at this page, these look mostly the same. And the places where we see significant differences are places where there's decorative elements, right? Like this W is pretty funky, that stands out, right? Whereas if we were to swap over and take a look at serifs, I think at least they start to look pretty different. I'm trying to find like a good, right? So we have some very like straight bar serifs. We have some like more classic serifs. We have some kind of in the middle. The serif typefaces are more decorative. They're gonna look a little bit more different. Uh, so you get a little bit more variety because that little bit gives designers a lot to play with, gives type designers a lot to play with um, in terms of adding flourishes and, and different feels to the typeface. Um, serifs were a more traditional uh, kind of look. We saw those in earlier kind of uh, type design. So from a design perspective, they tend to feel a little bit more like official or traditional when you look at like usually public documents, uh, if you have a diploma, if you have a marriage license, if you have a deed, <laughs> you know, all of those things tend to be set in serifs. The other thing about serifs that's really nice, they differentiate the letter forms. And we talked about that a little bit, right? And if you're setting books, if you're setting magazines, you'll see serifs used most often because they are more recognizable, right? Um, it's often recommended that uh, people with dyslexia will have an easier time reading uh, serif fonts than they will sans serif fonts. And again, that has to do with the differentiation of the letters. There are some fonts, uh, some typefaces that have been made specifically for people with dyslexia. I know um, Open Dyslexia. Can't find any fonts. I thought Open Dyslexic was in Google Fonts, but maybe not. And dyslexic. It's really cool, right? So uh, it has to do with, again, kind of differentiating the letters and it looks a little bit funky, weighted along the bottom. And that has to do with being able to tell them apart. It makes, right, like letters feel very different. A's and V's and B's and D's uh -huh. because of the, the kind of way that the weight is distributed. It makes them easier to differentiate. Yes, we use a ton of sans serifs in the web, in tech, in general. Um, they're often seen as being very like sleek and very modern, um, sometimes a little bit more approachable, right? And again, it's kind of that like, you'll find often that in art and design, there's one thing that has been established and then people will kind of swing the other way, right? Like. Uh, it's almost the way like fashion trends work, right? Like when long hemlines are in one season, short hemlines next, because we we want to switch, right? We go from really tight skinny jeans to like baggy jeans. We go from super low rise jeans in the 2000s to the like mega high rise kind of vintage ones that are very in right now. Um, 
I'm trying to think of like another non-fashion example for people that don't care about that. But it works in the same way um, in art and design. So serifs were kind of the earlier, uh, we see a lot more of that when we're looking at like early printmaking and stuff. And so they became very, um, very like established as that idea of like traditionalist and like, you know, when you looked at like an old printed book, it was always in a serif font. So when we wanted something to feel new and cool and hip and like trendy, sans serifs, right? It's kind of a reactionary choice. <laughs> Trap question, comic sans serif or sans? <laughs> I love that, serif or serif? <laughs> Um, but yeah, um, tells you right in the name, actually. That's that sans. Anything that has a sans in it is telling you that it is sans serif. <laughs> so, what do you do? Comic sans is in fact sans serif. <laughs> so you can see there's like just a little bit happening on the C, but overall, comic sans not uh none of those little kind of decorative lines which i know that's like a more serious answer that you were probably looking for um but yeah anytime you see that sans that is that is what that means the c has a little notch it does not have a serif the c has like a it's meant to mimic handwriting so it has handwriting uh decorations but it does not have the lines of a serif font right so when we look at these, we see, let's look at it. Um, I'm just gonna type the word comic sans here so that we can look at, right? This is a more defined serif. We see them, these like actual little lines. <laughs> so yes, the C has a decorative element, you are correct. But overall, uh, I would say that is more intended to mimic the like the real truth is probably that comic sans is a script right that it's, it's neither a serif or a sans serif it's a script font in the same way that like if we were to right yeah google fonts calls them handwriting this would probably be the category that i would give comic sans ah <laughs> if we're answering this question in full honesty right because it's more in line with something like this right with these kinds of handwriting or um script fonts so but uh i would say comic sans self-identifies as sans serif uh right there in the name and i'm gonna respect that that's my two cents on it <laughs> so Ooh. let's see what were we talking about parts parts of the character parts of the character here there it was. I was trying to find my tabs. I switched over. Here's a little bit of a side rant for you. I switched browsers recently. I got suckered in um, into something that I actually really like. <laughs> into an alternative browser, which I swore I'd never use as a web developer um, because I hate having to design for them. But uh, I was swayed by Arc. This is, I'm using Arc now, and it's got this sidebar. Uh, and your tabs go here instead of along the top, which does actually make a lot of sense, but is an adjustment uh, for someone who's been looking at tabs along the top of their screen for like a decade now. <laughs> so, um, but I do really like it. I like I like the customizability and the like separate workstations and everything of Arc. So I'm swayed. Consider me aboard the alternative browser train. It is Chromium based. Um, so it's not like, you know, it's, I haven't had any rendering issues with it yet, but that's always what stopped me from looking at like other non-standard browsers. It's like, yeah, you know, like I like the idea of more privacy and this and that, but I didn't want anything that would compromise my ability to like, you know, write CSS. <laughs> Thus far, Arc has been holding out. Although of course I've still got all my other browsers hanging out here so everything gets cross-tested but anyway <laughs> it's not why you're here you're here to talk about typefaces um the next thing that i want to talk about are shoulders right shoulders are the like curved or hooked uh maybe humped parts of a letter right 
So things like uh, M's, N's, H's, right? So this is a shoulder. This is a shoulder. This is a shoulder. Any of these kind of like rounded, uh, arcing or curved pieces, right? Um, and again, as we talked about a little bit, those tend to technically rise above the X height or the midline in order to create that visual balance that we need for the typeface to feel correct, <laughs> to feel balanced and to feel right. We talked um, a little bit already about serifs, uh, but that was the last thing on my list. So I'm gonna talk about it a little more. <laughs> serifs are these guys, right? These lines and they are uh, generally actual lines. Sometimes you will see them kind of connected a little bit more like this R uh, here on this part, but often they are more literal, right? You will see these actual kinds of, you know, straight lines <laughs> in a serif font, whereas in a sans serif, you will not. Sometimes you will see these like ears and terminals, right? Which again, handy terms, but not necessarily ones that you need to know. That's kind of where, um, where your font will kind of terminate and you'll see that like a little bit of a like a blob, right? And that has to do with, again, how we used to write. Because if you imagine when you were writing with like ink, right? Or when you stamp something with ink, there are places where the ink wells a little bit, you know? And it you see naturally when you write with a marker or with a, an old school ink pen, you will create these kinds of marks when you write. And typeface designers have mimicked that in a lot of cases, right? So this kind of stuff, your terminals, your ears, these little, little bits. And I would say that is what I would consider, <laughs> and not to like really harp on the Comic Sans question, but that's what I would consider that like notch on the C, right? If I were to give that a typographic term, I would call it more of a, a terminal um, than I would a serif, which, yeah very very picky very nitty-gritty um but that's my answer <laughs> there's some again kind of smaller ones i'm going to talk about some like niche terms now uh, which again i would say not necessarily things that you need to know just things that i think are cool now we're just into like cool type facts right <laughs> so when you have things that descend, uh, mostly G's do this. Occasionally you'll see like a Y do this. You'll get this like loop here when it comes down and makes a makes a round. That's a loop. When you have um, things that kind of connect right to here, it's a link or a nick, as you can see. There's also, and there's not an example here, but I think they're very cool, ligatures. So... Ligatures are, in my opinion, one of the coolest things you can do with type, right? They are like so unique and so fun. So there are some letters that when you place them next to each other, they can kind of like naturally flow into each other. Uh, and when we can do this, it makes the type feel like so cohesive, so smooth. And so oftentimes um, we'll do this, right? It like makes it more readable that the one that gets thrown around here right is fi because you see where the f that shoulder of the f uh often will kind of intersect with the dot on the i so when you can combine them it can make it feel very very smooth yeah here's a good example right fi you get this kind of like I had a professor that used to call this the the creepy hug, right? And what he meant was like hover hands. That just like wasn't a term when I was in college. But you know those like photos where people will go to hug and they like won't quite touch. You'll just see like the hand hovering above the shoulder and it's like deeply awkward. The type does that too, right? And that's effectively the same feeling that's happening here when you have like the FI or the FL. They're like close, but not quite touching. And you want them to either touch or like take a step <laughs> and our answer to that is ligatures where we can combine uh, these into like a new form uh, a new letter form that combines different letters 
uh, the ampersand, right, is actually the result of a very commonly used ligature. Um, I'm trying to remember what was in that one. It was... Ooh, I'm gonna look now. Yeah, here's some more examples that are really, really nice. You know, and like, they don't get used all that often. Uh, oftentimes, there are programs now that will kind of like notice when you've written two letters that go together into a ligature and you can kind of choose whether or not you want them to automatically use the ligature or not. Um, you can always, of course, set them by hand. You set them manually, type them manually. They just look really, I love them. I think they look beautiful. I think they look clean. I think they look visually interesting, you know, and uh, that's a very cool place to be. Let me see if I can find the ampersand uh, and what that used to be. Yeah, that's right. It was et, right? So like et is in like the Latin, you know, um, but you can kind of see it happening here. This was itself a ligature and we have made that now into a whole new form. It's kind of like evolved, you know, and went through the <laughs> Pokemon evolution into what it is now, right? Like this form that we created by using this ligature so much. This was just the way it was written. Uh, and we've, you know, kind of abstracted it into this whole new form, which I find endlessly interesting, right? Because we do the same thing still. Even like, you can look at the evolution of like the save icon, right? Where at first it was like very, very literal, like the floppy disk, you know? And we kind of moved from that into like, oh, you know, an arrow over to a disk or an arrow to a CD. And now we usually just kind of have like an, a down pointing arrow, sometimes into like a little box shape or something. We evolve these icons, we evolve these, this imagery based on how we're using it and what people have learned to look for and what people have learned to kind of comprehend and we see oh yeah here it's really small let me just whoop, wrong thing let me zoom in a bunch so you can see this development right of like how this moved how this icon evolved based on what people were looking for and how they were writing it and how they understood it and that's yeah I find that, personally, to be endlessly interesting to kind of watch that move through. Like, that's so cool. That's design. That's, that's effectively, you know, user experience design. <laughs> but on that note, <laughs> I'm going to cut it just a smidge short today, uh, again, because I talked about it a little bit before. We have webinars happening. Let me see if I can find the banner for the one that is about to start. Here we go. Yep. Free live Test Studio R3 2022 release webinar. It is not, in fact, too late to join. Um, and that is happening in about yeah, a little over. It'll be about 10 minutes by the time I'm done talking, <laughs> frankly. So it's not too late to go hop on over. Uh, you can grab that link and register for free and see all of the exciting stuff that is new. And I really do hope you will join us tomorrow at um, 11 a.m. Eastern time for a webinar for to uh, to see me and Alyssa and Carl break down all of the stuff that is new and exciting in uh, the Kendo UI release. Yeah. Thank you for having in, Scott. I'm sorry you caught just the last little bit of it. Uh, we are live. Yeah, for those of you that joined a little bit late, um, thank you, first off, for coming back. <laughs> I know uh, Dev by Design has been on a little bit of a hiatus. I was telling the folks earlier that that was uh, because I had a real fun time. I ruptured my left eardrum, uh, which made it very hard to wear AirPods and be live on stream. I am healed. I am back, rested, refreshed. And you can expect us back here every 10 a.m. Eastern time, you know, same bat time, same bat channel. And we're going to keep talking through design goodness. So if you ever have a topic that you would like me to talk about, a little something you would like to learn about specifically, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Katherine Grayson. Drop me a tweet. Tell me what you want to learn about. I'm open to all sorts of design stuff. And of course, we've got some great guests queued up. So keep coming back. Thank you. Thank you all for riding with me uh, as we came through that hiatus. And I look forward to seeing you back next week.
Thanks, y'all. <laughs>